Welcome to Marketers Talking AI. And our opening topic for today is, I think, the thing that's on everyone's mind, and that is Gemini, not the Winklevoss startup, <laughs> which Google, I feel so bad because, you know, Facebook, Winklevoss, and now Google is like maybe unintentionally killing at least their branding and searchability for it. <laughs> yeah, I, but, I wonder if it was intentional. Um, I feel like they're always, the, the two twins, I feel like they're always caught up in some drama some saga of corporate just espionage or something just they're right in the middle of it um, yeah. and they're busy fighting the the, the lawsuit or um, a case from sec for the billion dollar fraud case or something so i feel like they have other things oh, yeah. that on their minds right now <laughs> here's my i haven't i've watched like the the pre-recorded demo We've seen the news. I think we've probably seen all the same content. The thing on my mind is I feel like it's such a weird way to name products that you know of Gemini, which is the underlying engine, I guess, for Bard. They feel very unrelated, naming convention-wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, a, yeah, what's a Bard have to do with Gemini? Like when Apple was doing all of its yeah. OS names, you know, it had Leopard, it had all the big cats. Like that was a nice yeah. thematic approach i feel like the ai startups and then they right went now are to just nature. throwing out yeah nature yeah. yes sierra and all that um but ai startups right now are just throwing out whatever they can get their hands on um and i'm also so this is like my branding beef with a lot of the ai startups right now is almost for every company you now need to like know two names like i need to know google bard and i need to know like google gemini like I, and, but they're the same thing, but they're not the same thing. And me as a consumer, why do I have to remember two brand names? It sounds yeah. very confusing and overwhelming. Just give me one name. Like I don't, you know, roll out yeah. the different updates, my... but don't make. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause Bard is essentially just one of the front end options for Gemini. Right. And I, I would envision that down the road, there's going to be more, more than just Bard as a way to interact with Gemini. Yeah. Or are there going to be one Bard, but other Geminis in the future? Like is Bard going to be the thing Maybe. that sticks and then they keep under the updating the technology. Yeah. The yeah, next one will the, be Capricorn. Hmm. <laughs> that would be, can be a nice theme. I bet you yeah. they're going to just find another set of unfortunately placed founders to steal the name from. <laughs> um, Maybe. But I think from the general news that I've read, I haven't checked it out either. Um, from the general news and the demo that they had, the pre-recorded demo, um, it does feel like it's not fully complete of a product. Um, it seems like Google is scrambling, you know, to have the GPT-4 killer as the headlines keep trying to position it as, but from the different reviews that I've read uh, and different people trying, um, you know, code writing, copywriting with it, it does seem that uh, GPT-4 Turbo still outperforms Gemini. So I feel like there's a lot of media hoopla when I, whenever Google does something with AI, but the results have not yet been there. And, you yeah. know, may, maybe that'll change, but I think it speaks to the, you know, the first mover advantage of open AI and even with all of their corporate saga that they had, um, which oh, was yeah. crazy and, um, that they're still ahead and they're technologically, they're still ahead. So, um, yeah, I'm curious to see how Google proceeds with this and, you know, they are putting a lot of weight behind this and a lot of energy and time. So, yeah, it's interesting to see Google not be first to market. Because I feel like, so if we have a spectrum where Apple is, I'm going to say like the laggard, but you know when they come out with something that it's really, really good and mm -hmm. polished, I feel like Google is usually more on the cutting edge. Like Google Glass was so far before their time. Yeah. Google Voice, a million other Google products that they killed that I loved. It feels like Google <laughs> is typically like launching and testing and iterating and they feel really comfortable not having the most polished product. And perhaps this is where we're seeing Google start to shift where they're not first to market. 
and they're not also coming out with something super, super polished. It kind of feels yeah. like we have another announcement of nothing or like an announcement of something coming that isn't mm -hmm. quite here yet versus other products where they're announcing actual products. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, for many companies, as a strategy, that's fine. But if you're Google, you know, and you're not yeah. delivering like a product, it's like, wait, you guys are, you know, a multi-trillion dollar company. Like you, and you have been innovating in AI for years. So yeah. it's not like all of this uh, is new. Um, yeah, the I Pixel camera. Years, I was just like, mm -hmm. The Pixel camera is really well known because they use AI to make the photos better versus like yeah. Samsung, where they really rely on having a good camera in your phone. They, they yeah. have definitely been known as an innovator in the AI space. Yeah, so it's, you know, why, maybe this is the consumer facing side that they're traditionally have not really been good at, kind of like the more, they're better at rolling out, you know, the thing, they're not good at the narrative storytelling. But in this situation, I feel like both of the things are missing. Like they don't have a strong story, yeah. nor do they have a strong product. Um, I'm also curious if this has anything to do with like, Google being the most disruptable by generative AI and like that this, you know, generative AI kind of is taking them, you know, they, they built their company on this, this one thing, you know, revenues mm -hmm. from Google search and yeah. maybe they got complacent and maybe they, now they're scrambling to figure out how is this going to affect search, how is this going to affect their revenue and like yeah. they're trying to <laughs> not fall behind. Yeah, we That's saw Google traditionally have. was against AI content. And then they said, we're actually okay if you use, and when we say against, they were saying, if you use AI content, you're going to get dinged in your search. And then they said, we're okay with AI content as long as it's valuable to the end consumer. As long as it's good, it adds something additional. It's okay to use AI content because likely they don't know how to deal with it. And yeah, yeah it's interesting Google's kind of double-edged sword relationship with AI. Mm-hmm. So I think in 10 years, it's going to be, it's going to be a great book that comes out that like examines all of this in the same way that, you know, we've talked about, like, um, I think Kodak had that first digital camera, for example. I was just then, thinking about that. <laughs> and then, then, you know, it becomes like a famous, uh, case study for, you know, business schools yeah. where they like, Oh, like this is how Kodak messed up and they had the technology, but yeah. they didn't do anything. And here's your eight lessons. And just move on yeah. and maybe go it's gonna be and the now, same thing yeah. now kodak is really you, just like a company that holds a lot of like ip <laughs> yeah. and patents and maybe and maybe google becomes a data company and they recede to the background um so it, it's gonna be interesting yeah. to see it's gonna you know um and we're so far away from the field to shaking itself out you know i think microsoft has been the unexpected winner um, in this AI oh, yeah. world currently, especially with everything again happening with open AI and their partnerships there and investments. Um, you know, I didn't expect Microsoft to become a leader again, um, in, in yep. from like a, a consumer standing side of things, but you know, here they are. Yeah. So. I mean, they are this monolith that somehow has learned how to move really rapidly and ag agilely, which tends to be counterintuitive with a company their size. Uh, I think the next like big thing that we'll see in terms of shaping out the hierarchy of these companies is going to be the video component. Um, you know, I think generative AI, like when Dolly 2 came out, I think it was last summer, like it really put uh, on a lot of people's minds, okay, AI is here. And then GPT-3 was like, you know, one more step of like, wow, like, we're able to do so many things, so many unexpected things. And I think when the video text to video gets solved and there's a lot of companies gunning for that space, when that gets solved and when that becomes like a real thing, I think people will have another sudden shift is going to feel sudden to a lot of people. It's like, wow, like AI was able to create an entire video. Um, and I think yeah. the general public is going to be, we're going to hit another like hype cycle. I think we're kind of slowing down a little bit. Um, but I think that hype, that, development will give more fuel for again for maybe google to do something or for apple to do something um but right now there's a lot of interesting companies that are really trying to crack that uh space open uh pika which one's your favorite uh, one of the um i would say runway um 
mostly because that's the one I've used. <laughs> uh, Pika, I am still on the wait list. Um, you know, that's the curse of AI tools today is usually yeah. you're on a wait list. Um, but yeah, Runway and Pika right now are like the two big names that I've been seeing in the text to video. And, you know, we, we're, we're yet to see what OpenAI is doing with, with that. Um, we haven't seen anything from Google. So again, maybe the text to video will be like that new step for a lot of, for one of these companies to like try to get ahead on it. So yeah, we'll see what Google does and we'll see the, how the video space develops. Yeah, I've really liked what Adobe is doing with their um, intelligent fill for photos too. And mm -hmm. I feel like they've been doing some really unique things. So I wouldn't be surprised if Adobe just cropped up with some really amazing video tool that no yeah. one expected to see. Uh, Vimeo, I would put Vimeo in that category. Vimeo has been, been oh. doing a lot in AI and I've been seeing their name. I don't know the exact things that they've been doing, but they've been coming up and I kind of forgot about Vimeo. You know, to be honest, yeah. I feel like at some point Vimeo was like up there with YouTube a little bit, but kind of gotten forgot, got forgotten, got forgotten. And now AI is giving them some new life. So maybe, yeah. maybe it will be Vimeo. Maybe it's going to be, um, maybe it will be Adobe because they do have the, the users, they have the community. So, yeah, I've been, uh, I don't know if, have you checked out? Uh, the x.ai's uh, Grok tool? I've, I laugh because whenever I hear it, I think of Revenge of the Nerds, and I think of, and it's not, his name was not Grok. Um, I can't remember his name, but it was like the big football player animal, I think, who like pledged the frat, and then he'd always be like, Nerds! I feel like Grok was like a bully. Wasn't he though? He was the bully in something. Anyway, I've seen clips where people are showing like responses from it. And it seems just like awkward humor. I don't see anything yeah. super compelling. And it kind of honestly reminds me of like Trump launching his own social network because he was sick of Twitter. Like Elon Musk has now launched his own AI to compete with the other AIs because he doesn't want to be left out of the conversation. Yeah. Well, interestingly, if you work on the timelines backwards of, of when he said they started working on it and when it actually came out, um, it actually coincides. Remember what, like six months ago, Elon Musk was like pushing for OpenAI and the other companies to pause on all AI developments until we can figure yeah. out like a safe way to move forward. That's around the same time that they apparently began working on Grok. So... <laughs> I so he was like, you was guys stop your development so we can catch up with ours. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, you know. Love um, it. Yeah, Very Elon your move. assessment makes sense. It, it feels forced, like the humor and like the sarcasm. Um, I think the most interesting thing out of Grok, and that's the whole other thing with the naming. It's like, is it Grok or is it X.AI, which is also now confusing with X Twitter and Anyway, too many X's, too many Grok's. Um, the most interesting thing is that Grok is connected to the, the fire hose. And oh. when I think about that, I, I, you know, it's, it's been a long time since, since anyone has had access to the full Twitter fire hose. And I remember in, when the fire hose got restricted. The fire hose. I, 2016? I was at a company that had fire hose access yeah. and the fire hose got restricted. And I remember when it happened and it was like painful. Wow. But God, I think it was, I want to say like 2016. The fire hose. What a so clever... it's interesting. It's interesting <laughs> though. It's Just interesting because it is like, hose. oh yeah. They're... If I'm um, launching an API company or something, I would call it fire hose. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it is interesting though because if I think of like, like the, at 10 years ago, pre Elon Twitter, the fire hose was valuable companies mm -hmm. in order to get fire hose access, you had to have a certain amount of ad spend on the API side. Like if you were a partner, you had to have a certain amount of money spent through your platform. And that's how we lost it is we didn't spend enough on Twitter. We lost fire hose access to get it back. We'd have to get advertisers to spend more money through our platform. So it was directly tied to helping Twitter mm -hmm. be profitable. 
the value of the fire hose five years ago so much more than the value of the fire hose now. Like if you're building a model just on tweets and on Twitter's data, what are you like, is that really valuable? I feel like Twitter's kind of a cesspool right now. Yeah. yeah um, I, don't, I don't know if I'd want something built on it. Maybe I'm a pessimist. No, what, what, I, I guess what I'm thinking through is, that's a really good point. And, and the reason why it becomes even more of a cesspool, because Twitter 10 years ago was chronological. Like there was something to being able yeah. to have like the, the huge, just everyone throw out your stuff and like, then you can parse it out, then you can make sense. Now, because the, the fire hose is already algorithmic, like you're using an algorithm to curate the tweets and how people will tweet, mm -hmm. which then you're training on your algorithm for AI. And it becomes, again, this example of like the recursive feedback. You know, it, like once yeah. you have, once you use the feedback to, to do the thing, eventually it becomes noise. It's, it's like, you know, microphone yeah. speaker. I bet feedback, it's racist it's like, too. It's probably very <laughs> to be racist. honest. Didn't, <laughs> do you remember when they built a bot on Twitter? Uh, on, on tweets or something like two years ago, Microsoft built yeah. a bot and became like a Nazi within like a day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I very much remember you know, that. Sure there's a metric of time to Nazi and it's probably going down. Yeah. Well, it's like people have done so, studies on TikTok starting brand new TikTok accounts and how long does it take for you to end up in something that's either extreme on the left or the right side? You know, it's fun. Every time, anytime I go on YouTube, uh, logged out, like if I go on, um, in a private browser, for example, to YouTube, uh, logged out YouTube is such a different world. And you kind of forget yeah. how, how much of a, um, how much customization your algorithm gives you when you're like using the services without like your constraints, it's like a whole other world. And yeah. I, I guess I'm curious what Twitter looks like now. Like, what does logged out Twitter look like? I don't think logged out Twitter is anything. Because I feel like it's still... I feel like logged out Twitter is still filtered through an algorithm that's going to sway you one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. And I'm curious what way it's going to sway. <sighs> Maybe, yeah. Maybe I'm being pessimistic. So. I feel like I'm really real pessimistic. <laughs> it's, um... It's, I think it's an interesting interplay between the giants of the last 10 decades. Like the social networks were the giant companies that have built themselves in the last 10 years. Right now it's like, and now there's th these new gods emerging. And right now I'm reading American Gods. So I have the language of divine battles in my head. But, you know, you can imagine the titans, the old gods would be the, you know, social networks. And now they're trying to figure out like, how do we integrate mm -hmm. ourselves with AI or how can AI integrate social media and social yeah. networks. And I think it's going to be really messy. Uh, it's going to be really messy and it's going to, it's going to suck for consumers. Um, I think the enchidification of the internet is going to continue to dwindle. Have you heard of that term enchidification? Mm, I just, no, I was trying to figure out what it meant as you were saying. Yeah, it's um, it's a wonderful essay by I forgot uh, his name. He's he's like a culture writer. Anyway, it's it's the idea that internet platforms become shittier over time because by its very nature, it has to be a really good service when it launches. Like it's great for users, people love it, mm -hmm. and then the business pressure and the business model evolution winds up making it more and more favorable to businesses and less and less favorable to users where eventually in 10 years, it's like a shitty platform. You can have examples of like, you know, Facebook and like the obvious ones, but even like Google, like when Google first launched like 15 years ago and you're using it, it's great. You're getting all of this like unique content yeah. and you're not, but now you're seeing SEO optimized content and everything just feels like you're not getting anything valuable. Um, TikTok, I feel the same way about TikTok. Like I used to love TikTok a year and a half ago. Now. I'm yeah. noticing how much they're pushing for you to try all the different features and check out live and the shopping and they're oh, trying so many to shopping. Yeah. They're trying to extract more and more, you know, value out of you. And yeah. that's the model. That's literally the model of 
VC backed <laughs> companies and platforms. So um, yeah. it's only going to continue, I feel, with AI because they're not going to use AI to make it better for users. I think we're seeing uh, an almost counterculture start to crop up, which Pavel, you and I see in a lot of our conversations of people who, when it comes to content, who are saying like AI is the worst thing, you have to have human written content, and they're almost pushing back so strongly against it. We see this, we saw the same thing when timelines started to be algorithmic instead of time-based, where I think there's gonna be a rise of some platform or some technologies and where they really say we're humans, this is human generated, it's humans talking to humans, it's human verified, there's no AI anywhere. It's going to be like a, yeah. a revolution against AI and business. Yeah. It'll die. It won't be as efficient. It won't make money. <laughs> but I think it'll I, be I agree. Yeah. It, it, I think it'll pop up, but I don't think it'll compete. It won't have the economies of scale to compete. But I think mm -hmm. there's going to be, in the same way, you know, hand, you could get some handcrafted like cheese or something. I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know if artisanal yeah, I guess, uh, bespoke artisanal cheese that's social media artisanal content artisanal cheese there's some artisanal content out there um, and maybe that's what newsletters yeah. are maybe that, that's the sub stack niche uh, you know you're pay oh. and especially because you're paying for them you're paying yeah. for like, people's essays and thoughts um, but I guess I'm waiting like I think the timeline example is a really good idea like when it was introduced it was I don't think people understood the ramifications of it. Um, and I yeah. imagine in the next year or two, there's going to be a company that introduces something that feels wrong, but in two, three years, we'll feel like, yeah, that's the obvious thing. I'm betting it's going to be paid social media services, um, like subscriptions. And I oh. will actually, like, I think in three years, people will pay for social media. And it'll feel yeah. weird that we used to have a time that we didn't. And well, they're starting to, for Facebook in Europe, they're rolling yeah, out, I think as yeah. part of their their the data settlement, they're rolling out a, yeah, the, a paid version where you get no ads. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like $17. And, I think that, and that, that's going to be, I think, the world that we're going to see. That's going to be the divide between, you know, if you have money, you're not going to see ads. If you don't have money, you're going to see a lot yeah. of ads. And that follows with subscriptions and, you know, all, all of these companies. And I will credit uh, Elon Musk for like pushing that with X, like this idea that people are going to pay for social media. Yeah. I think he was the guinea pig that opened the eyes to, for a lot of execs that, Hey, like maybe this oh, model yeah. has to change. So. Yeah. Um, I would agree with that. I think everyone is like, users will revolt. No one will do it. And he rolled it out for X. I mean, I had a subscription, when it was three dot when Twitter blue first rolled, I was like three dollars a month. I had a subscription because I love Twitter and I wanted to support yeah. them. I do not have a subscription <laughs> to <laughs> X, whatever they yeah. call it. X blue X. I don't know. Um, I don't know. But yeah, I, I think I think the the biggest things that I'm excited about to see, and it's also interesting. We had the one year anniversary of uh, ChatGPT like a few weeks ago. Um, as the whole Sam Altman thing was happening, um, it feels surreal that it's only been a year that like, it, it yeah. feels like there has been a sudden shift out of nowhere and it's only been a year, but it feels like we've lived a lifetime of AI. What well, are you excited can you imagine, about? Can you imagine life without it? It would be weird. It would be, yeah, yeah it, it would be it has been such a normalized daily use for me that it, it's weird. If so, it's like if someone says, hey, you can't use like your browser. Google. It's like, I mean, yeah. I, could, I, I could live without it, but like how am I gonna access the internet? <laughs> like through apps or something? Yeah. Um, what are you excited well, about? Well, a lot of people for... think Facebook is, so a lot of people think Facebook's the entering point to the internet still, so. Yeah. Um, I am, I saw Facebook actually rolled out their AI image generator. Um, mm. It didn't feel too different to me than other options out there. I think what I'm still really excited about are the advancements AI will make that we're not talking about that no one cares about because they're not exciting. 
I've been doing a lot of data work and I've been really appreciating AI for that. So mm. yeah, I'm excited to see how it all susses out, but there's not one thing where I'm like, yes, like that's amazing. Yeah. So you're yeah. trying to see yeah, new use cases of AI. Yeah, I think everyone's been yeah. stuck on generation. Text generation, image yeah. generation, video generation, and it's like there's other things that AI can do. <laughs> yeah. Like data so analysis much else. and Right. Um, but if you're listening, let us know if you're listening. <laughs> if you're out there and you're alive and you're not an AI, let us know in the comments what you're excited about. And we're always excited to hear those. Yeah. And we'll see you uh, next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, humans.